In this video, let's cover fixing phase as we discuss all the complex aspects of phase relations, what they mean for your project, and more. But first, we have a new membership that gives you 10 free masters, one additional free master per month, and you get 50% off for mastering services. More on that at the end of the video. Let's start by explaining frequency, phase, and interference. Before we cover fixing phase issues, it's crucial that we understand phase, some of the terminology and the general concepts. Now, if you're familiar with all these ideas, feel free to skip ahead. There are some chapter markers in the video, but if you need a refresher or this is all new to you, I'd recommend watching this chapter. So let's start by looking at the waveform of a sine wave. Now a sine wave is just a really simple one frequency signal. So it keeps things easy if we're trying to learn some concepts. So every waveform has a peak and a trough. Now just think of a peak as having a positive value and a trough as having a negative value, like a plus for the peak and a minus for the trough. Although we're dealing with a digital sine wave right now, in the physical world, these peaks and troughs are created by compressions and rarefactions. Now, compressions are when air molecules are pressed close together or compressed, which is represented here as the peak. Rarefactions are when the molecules spread out, which is represented here as the trough. Now, the concept is very similar to a wave in water. When the water's molecules are close together, the wave peaks, and then after the peak crashes, everything gets spread out. So this is the general shape of a waveform. When a sound wave is of a higher frequency, we have more of these peaks and troughs per second. For example, a 1 hertz wave is one peak and one trough within the time span of one second. So it's pretty simple if we expand on that idea. A 20 hertz wave has 20 peaks and 20 troughs per second, and so on. A full peak trough cycle is also called an oscillation. So a 20 hertz wave is 20 full oscillations within one second. Now that we had the general idea of a sound wave, let's talk about how these waves interact with one another. So let's say that I have one 20 hertz wave, then I have another 20 hertz wave, and they're playing at the same time. If we observe the oscillations, we'll notice that they align. So one track's peaks are matching up with the other track's peaks, and the troughs are matching up with the troughs. If both signals were played simultaneously, we'd have something called constructive interference. Constructive interference occurs when two or more signals add to one another. So look at the output. If I played one 20 hertz wave, the overall amplitude is lower than if I played both together. Since they're aligned, they add to one another in turn, causing a higher amplitude signal when they're combined. But let's look at what happens when they aren't aligned. If I invert the phase of one of the signals, the peaks of one waveform occur at the same time as the troughs of the other waveform. If we play both at the same time, we'll notice that we have no signal. This is because we have perfect destructive interference. The amplitude of the two waveforms, the frequency, and the timing are all identical. However, the troughs cancel out the peaks, the peaks cancel out the troughs, and we're left with complete phase cancellation. This is also sometimes called a null signal, or one that is completely nullified. Now let's go back to having two signals that are identical, but this time, I'm going to shift the timing of the second waveform. So in this example, some parts of the peaks and troughs are aligned, but some are not. When they're aligned, we should get constructive interference. When they aren't aligned, we'll notice destructive interference. Again, let's go back to having two signals identical, but this time, I'm going to shift the amplitude of one, making it say 6 dB louder than the other. Now, right now, since they're aligned, we have constructive interference, but with a higher amplitude at our output than in the previous constructive interference example. If I was to invert the phase of one track, we'll notice that the signal does not completely null. Everything that matches is canceled or nullified. However, one signal still has 6 dB more than the other. So now we know that both timing and amplitude affect phase interference. Let's look at one more common cause of phase interference, frequency. So again, I'll use a 20 hertz wave for the demo, but let's now include a 100 hertz wave. So now the relationship becomes more complex. There are multiple points in which we have constructive and destructive interference. So what I want you to keep in mind is that due to the complexity of phase relations between various signals, there's absolutely no way that we can eliminate destructive interference completely. That was unless we want all of our music to be single frequency sine waves, but that doesn't sound like a good idea. So let's look at one more conceptual topic before we move on to some more practical ideas. Next, we're explaining phase rotation versus phase interference. So whereas phase interference has to do with the relationship between multiple signals, phase rotation has to do with the orientation of peaks and troughs within an individual signal or track. For example, inverting the phase, like I did in the last chapter, is a complete phase rotation in which we completely flip the peaks and the troughs. 
Phase rotation is also relevant when we discuss asymmetrical waveforms or waveforms that lean more toward the positive or the negative side. This happens with instruments that have aggressive compressions. For example, a trumpet typically emphasizes compressions over rare factions or the positive in the peaks over the negative in the troughs. There's nothing wrong with this really. It's not going to affect the sound of the signal or the track, but it will likely affect how our processors interact with it. So if it's possible, it's best to remedy any asymmetrical waveform by using some phase rotation. Currently, the only processor that I know of that can adjust the phase rotation is Isotopes RX. Its phase module will measure the asymmetry and rotate the phase as needed. Again, it doesn't affect the sound, the amplitude, or anything like that. It only affects the relationship of peaks and troughs, but all the information is still present. So just to clarify, whereas phase interference, or what I personally sometimes call phase relations, has to do with two or more competing signals, phase rotation is referring to the adjustment of peaks and troughs within a single signal or track. Now phase rotation can cause phase interference, but we're gonna cover that in more detail later on in the video. Now that we know the concepts, let's discuss how we can attempt to minimize destructive interference, starting with recording. When recording, there are two main causes of phase interference. The first being multiple microphones being used on a single sound source. For example, if I was to use a stereo pair to mic an acoustic guitar, then the waves that hit one mic will vary slightly from the waves that hit the other mic, either in frequency, amplitude, time, or compression and rarefaction. Now the second contributing factor is the room. As the performance occurs, the room will reflect and refract sound waves. Sometimes it sounds great, sometimes it doesn't. It depends on the recording environment. A heavily insulated or dry room helps to minimize this type of interference by absorbing sound waves before they can travel back to the microphone, but as I'm sure you know, sometimes the reflections can help augment the sound, add some life to the recording, and so on. So this means that we need to be concerned about two things when we're recording, at least when considering phase relations. The first is our microphone placement, and the second, our recording environment. And of course, these two elements can play heavily into one another. Starting with mic placement, we should attempt to keep any two or more microphones the same distance from a sound source. Although this won't be perfect, it's going to help minimize differences in timing between the multiple signals. For example, if we're recording a drum set and we're using a spaced pair overhead technique, it helps to measure the distance of each from the snare or the kick. Ideally, these two will be placed the same distance from the kit. Now this is going to help to lessen differences in the recorded frequencies and amplitudes. If it doesn't, then to match the amplitude, we could apply more gain to the microphone that has a lower level, or we could fix it during mixing. Also, as you'd imagine, since each microphone uses different capsules and circuitry, resulting in varying frequency and dynamic responses, it helps to use a matched pair to keep the signals as similar as possible. Lastly, the room is harder to control. Most production, especially for drums, is digital nowadays, so you don't need to worry about this too much, but if you're recording in a room, try to dampen the reflections unless the room has been designed with the proper architecture and materials to create a pleasant sound. With these ideas covered, let's take a more practical approach and discuss how to fix these issues when we're mixing. So let's cover manually fixing phase interference with polarity. Now, as you might have noticed during the first chapter, I can use some utility plugins to affect the polarity of the signal. In Logic Pro, the Gain Utility plugin offers phase inversion, but many other DAWs include similar stock plugins. Another plugin I'm going to use is a correlation meter, which I'll place on the stereo output. So what we're going to do is use something called a left-right method, which I came across when I was watching this video from a channel called Brass Palace. So big thank you to that engineer, I think his name is Chris, for sharing this really helpful idea. In short, whenever we have a multi-tracked instrument, like a drum set, we'll use phase inversion and observe our correlation meter until all of the tracks have the best possible relationship. So let's start with the drum overheads and pan those completely to the left. Then we'll bring in our kick and then pan that completely to the right. So right now, both are soloed, the overheads are panned left and the kick right, and we're observing our correlation meter on the stereo output. If we have a positive value with the correlation meter, that's generally a good sign. If it's negative, it's generally a bad sign. With the gain utility plugin inserted on the kick and while observing the correlation meter, I'll invert the phase and see how this affects the correlation. If this inversion improves the correlation, I'll keep it inverted. If the original phase rotation was better, I won't invert the polarity. It's really that simple. Once I've measured the kick and decided which polarity is best, I'll keep it soloed and then pan it to the left with the overheads. Next, I'm going to work on the snare. So the kick and the overheads are panned to the left and the snare is to the right. Again, I'm going to use this gain utility plugin, which is inserted on the snare while observing the correlation meter. 
which is again on the stereo output. Once again, I'll see which polarity improves the relationship. When the snare is done, I'll pan it to the left and go through the other drum multi-tracks like the toms, the hi-hats, and any other related tracks and repeat the process. Once I have everything inverted or kept as it was originally, according to what results in the best correlation, I'll put all the tracks back in the middle. Let's take a listen to a live recorded drum set. We'll do a before and after, and you're going to notice that the drums sound more focused after the method has been introduced. That said, keep in mind that you might like the more spread out sound that comes with some more phase cancellation, so using your ears is always important. Next, let's cover manually fixing phase interference with delay. Inverting the phase isn't the only way to improve phase relations between multi-tracked instruments. We could also use sample delay to adjust the timing of a track until its waves better align with another recording of that same instrument. So let's go back to our drum example. I'm going to remove all of the utility plugins, so basically everything is back to how it was originally. Instead of the utility plugin though, this time I'm going to use this sample delay plugin called Sound Delay by Voxingo. It's completely free, and it works with a lot of DAWs on multiple operating systems, so I definitely recommend checking it out. Also, it helps to know that this doesn't delay the signal like a stylistic or creative temporal delay instead. Imagine it's simply pushing back the full signal by the number of samples or the milliseconds that are introduced. Next, we're going to use the same method that we used last time. That is, put a correlation meter on the stereo output, solo the overheads and the kick with the overheads panned to the left and the kick to the right. Then I'm going to slowly increase the number of samples by which the kick is delayed. As I adjust the kick's timing, I'll keep an eye on the correlation meter. Whenever the correlation is as positive as I can possibly get it, I'll keep the settings, close the plugin, pan the kick to the left with the overheads, and then move on to the next track that's part of the multi-tracked instrument. Just like before, this would be the snare. I delay it until it correlates as best as possible, then repeat this process for all of the drum tracks. Now keep in mind that this doesn't need to be done for separately recorded instruments. For example, say after I recorded the drums, I used one microphone to record a tambourine or a shaker. I would not consider this as part of the multi-track drums. With that said, let's take a listen to the drums having their phase adjusted with this method. Again, we'll do a full AB, and keep in mind that you might prefer the non-adjusted or the original recording. Next, let's talk about phase interference within a processor. So far, we've considered how phase interference can occur between multiple signals, be it constructive or destructive interference. Another thing that's important to consider is how a plugin can alter the phase of a signal simply by processing it. Now, this occurs most notably with equalizers since they utilize multiple internal filters to create amplitude changes, which require shifts in the phase rotation to make this happen. To show you what I mean, let's take a look at this Burnham EQ analyzer. With it, we could monitor the phase changes that occur when an equalizer alters the frequency response. In most instances, this doesn't make a big difference, but you'll notice that if we use a high pass filter, the shift becomes pretty aggressive. If the slope is increased to 18 dB per octave or greater, this is going to cause the phase to shift 180 degrees. Practically speaking, this affects the overall frequency response. In the instance of a high pass filter, a small to moderate resonance filter is going to be created right above the cutoff frequency. More importantly though, let's consider how equalization can affect other signals when we deal with a multi-tracked instrument. So if we have multiple signals, all containing info or waveforms of the same instrument, equalizing one track but not another can have very interesting consequences. So let's go back to our drum example. Again, we're going to use a correlation meter on the output, but this time, let's keep the correlation or the phase relationships that we achieved with the delay-based phase alignment. To showcase this, I'm going to solo the overheads, the kick, and the snare, and use the same methods as before. So right now, the drums have pretty good phase relations, everything correlates pretty well, but let's see what happens when I add a high pass filter to the snare. We'll notice that altering the frequency response affects the correlation in a much more significant way than you'd expect. Now because the EQ affects the phase rotation, this shifts the peaks and the troughs of the affected snare, in turn altering the phase relationships between the close mic snare and the other signals that also include the snare, however faint that inclusion might be. Now there is a way to avoid this while still being able to equalize the snare, but we're going to cover that in the next chapter. For now, let's take a listen to the EQ being used on a snare that has already been adjusted to correlate with other multi-tracked instruments, and notice how the EQ has a negative impact on the correlation.
Now's a good time to talk about linear phase and phase correction. So the way that we fix the issue from the last chapter is to use a linear phase filter. Many equalizers include an option to use a linear phase setting. This is going to correct the phase rotation that's caused by the equalizer, in turn, avoiding the phase interference that's caused by that rotation. Now, just to check this, let's take a look at the Burnham EQ analyzer again. And by the way, this plugin is free if you want to test your plugins for yourself. And we'll notice that the phase stays at zero degrees. In other words, no phase rotation occurs. Next, let's take a look at the correlation meter and perform the same test that we did in the last chapter. We'll notice that the correlation doesn't change when we introduce the same high pass filter if the EQ is set to a linear phase mode. Again, this is because we're not introducing phase rotation and subsequently avoiding any changes to the phase relationships. Now, although linear phase filters are incredibly useful for this reason, they do have a drawback called pre-ringing distortion. This distortion occurs after the signal passes through the processor. However, when our DAWs correct the timing due to the latency caused by the linear phase setting, the small distortion gets centered directly on the original signal. This can affect transients and create a strange ringing sound in the low frequencies. However, the effects are really mild, so the pros in this situation definitely outweigh the cons. So let's take a listen to the same high pass filter being used, but this time we're going to use a linear phase EQ. We'll notice that the correlation doesn't change like it did when using a minimum phase or zero latency filter. Now one more thing I want to cover is parallel processing and phase interference. So last up, I want to quickly talk about a big issue to avoid, especially if you're concerned about the phase relations of your mix, or in this case, mix or master. Now, parallel processing is a useful technique, but it can quickly cause the same issues that we've covered in the last chapter. So let's say that we want to add parallel EQ to the drum bus. I know this isn't a common form of processing, but bear with me just for the moment. Say I wanted to isolate the mids of the drums for the sake of processing, just the mid frequencies, but with a parallel setup. Well, we'll notice that this does something very similar to our snare in chapter 8. Since we're adjusting the peaks and the troughs of the signal via phase rotation, when the two signals are combined, we'll notice destructive phase interference. Except this time, it's a lot worse. Now, since the signals were originally identical, shifting the phase rotation of the parallel track with an EQ has a huge impact on the phase relations. So think back to chapter 1, when I was adjusting the timing of one of the two 20Hz waves, it would greatly affect the relationship between them, because in all other ways, they were identical. So when we combine a signal with an identical signal, like in parallel processing, but change the phase rotation or invert the phase, we can expect severe cancellation. Notice that when we observe the output, or the combination of the original signal and the parallel process signal, we have huge notch filters at the cutoffs. Which makes sense because these filters are where we're seeing large changes to the phase rotation. Again, the remedy for this is avoiding phase rotation by using a linear phase EQ. So let's listen to two examples, one in which a parallel signal is being equalized with minimum phase filtering, and one in which it's being equalized with linear phase filtering. Notice how we don't have any issues when we use the linear phase filter type. So as I was saying at the beginning of the video, I'd like to tell you about our membership and how it could help you with your productions. When logging in, you're going to see the main membership home screen. On the left hand side, you'll find a sidebar with multiple tabs. If you have a song that you want to hear mastered, select the Mastering Services tab, follow the link, and upload your song or songs. When you sign up for the membership, we'll master your first 10 songs for free. Additionally, every month you're going to receive one additional free mastered song, and these monthly free mastered songs will accumulate in your account until you're ready to use them. Furthermore, you get access to the Sage Audio University, or SAU, and currently our School of Mastering course is available in its entirety. It's a 21 video, nearly 4 hour course that teaches mastering in depth from a technical, practical, and creative perspective. A complete School of Mixing course is going to be out next, which as a member you'll get access to at no extra cost. The same goes for the many other courses that we have planned in the future. Back to the home screen, members can access our SAU community, where you could introduce yourself, ask questions, share insights and experiences, and connect with like-minded and passionate artists and engineers. 
To further strengthen this community, we created the SAU Mix Review Community. Here you can post your mixes and get feedback from us and your fellow producers and engineers. Last up, you get some great perks like 51 mixing and mastering chain templates, 20 unmixed multi-track sessions from various artists spanning multiple genres that you could use for mixing practice, 42 finished mixes for mastering practice, and 39 plug-in presets created by our engineers. Now, all of this is available to you for a low monthly cost, and if you sign up for the membership today, you'll receive a custom 70% discount, which brings the total monthly membership cost down to $15. And this discount is going to be locked in, so you'll continue to receive it for as long as you're a member. If you have any questions about our membership, our services, our education, or just need some help with an upcoming project, please feel free to contact us anytime. Thanks for watching.